Ken is the Provincial Agrologist with Ducks Unlimited. He received his master's degree in plant science from the University of Saskatchewan, and his work was on root development and water use of direct seeded winter wheat. He has continued to research and promote winter wheat in his position as Provincial Agrologist with Ducks Unlimited Canada, with whom he has worked for over 30 years. He has been privileged to serve on many boards, including Winter Cereals Manitoba, Winter Cereals Canada, and the Manitoba Zero Tillage Research Association. Ken is past winner of the Canadian Non-Farmer of the Year as selected by the Mandac Zero Till Farmers Association. Uh, so we'll pull up Ken's presentation now. Good morning. I chose the title of this topic, Breaking Through the Yield Ceiling for Winter Wheat, because over the last 10 or 15 years, if you look at the egg census data, winter wheat fields in Manitoba have generally been in that 60 to 70 bushel an acre range. And, you know, when you look at the variety potential, especially the new varieties out there of over 100 bushels an acre in our environment, it's just um, not quite good enough. So I think we can do better. Um, as a result, we decided to uh, look at three major agronomic practices that will help us break through this yield ceiling. That includes uh, seeding date, seed treatment, and balanced nutrition. When I'm looking at seeding date, we're very lucky to have Dr. Yvonne Lolly and Dr. Navit Brar have uh, done research into this extensively across the prairies and shown the impacts that uh, uh, different seeding dates have on winter wheat. So thank you very much, Yvonne, for providing this data to me. Uh, one of the implications in Manitoba, we find that farmers are planting winter wheat later than normal, um, historical. Uh, that's due to many things, including longer season canola cultivars. And, you know, we don't always get the best weather come September. Um, often it's really dry, like it was this last year, that makes producers reticent to seed. And in the previous years, it was uh, really wet weather that made it difficult to um, get onto the land and seed. So this um, hinders uh, seeding winter wheat and obviously um, causes people to think about seeding it later or, or maybe earlier in a few cases if they have some early harvested crops. Uh, but they're frequently worried about the risks of, of seeding early or late. And um, often we think of it as catastrophic risk, you know, that you won't get a crop or you might not get your yield and and uh, the study goes into that and and finds some interesting results. So the objectives of the study was to evaluate the impact of a range of target seeding dates on yield and also um, looked at the effect of fungicide seed treatments on winter wheat. It's something that producers are looking at. There's more research into the area and there does seem to be some benefits. So they wanted to quantify that. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but if you keep things uh, uh, fairly simple to start with here, you, you, they seeded starting around August 15th, and then every 15 days thereafter. So September 1st, 15th, all the way up to November 1st, which was basically a dormant seeding, which means the, the soils were so cool, the crop did not emerge that fall and came up the following spring. Um, at each of these, dates there was a seed treatment um, done and and, uh, uh, and a control also to compare it to and um, one thing i'd like to point out is that uh, flourish was the variety that was utilized in this study back when they were planning it uh, that was the go-to variety looked like it had tremendous potential and it was an excellent variety in in so many different ways not but horrendous when it came to Fusarium, so it fell out of favor very quickly here in Manitoba at least. And uh, the reason why I want to point it out is because Flourish is only rated fair for winter hardiness, which means the results from this study are probably pretty conservative. The newer varieties uh, will um, have much higher uh, winter hardiness. Um, Emerson is rated good. Wildfire is uh, emerging as a one of the leaders in Manitoba as far as acres, and it was um, rated as very good, as is Gold Rush. So we expect those varieties to get through the winter and, and harder conditions in the fall better than Flourish will. <clears throat> the measurements, uh, she took several 
um, measurements in this study. The ones I'm going to focus on for simplicity stake in this study are plant counts and grain yield. Uh, here's a slide indicating all the areas that were uh, under study in the prairie provinces, and most being in Manitoba, but there were three sites in each of Saskatchewan and Alberta. The results. The effect of uh, seeding date, this chart is a little busy, but I'll, I'll simplify it a little bit here. Along this side, we have yield increasing up this axis, and we have growing degree days increasing along this axis. So the highest yielding variety or treatment in every year was set at 100, and everything else was a percentage of that. So that's called the relative yield, and we'll examine that on this axis. And you'll also notice that if you plant your fall crops early, they're going to get more growing degree days. So um, they're going to end up on this end of the spectrum, which is why early planting aligns over here. And from this, we can see that the ideal planting dates fall right along the area where you receive about 660 growing degree days after seeding. If you seed earlier than that, these dates align approximately with August 15th. There is a little bit of a yield penalty. And, uh, and once you get into the later seeding dates here, you know, towards uh, mid and late October, you do see more of a yield penalty. But the interesting thing for this, for me, is that, you know, there, it, what it shows is that the later seeding dates, you are seeing um, a yield penalty, but it's not a catastrophic failure of the field. As, as a matter of fact, there's this whole white area indicates that, you know, we did see yields under all the conditions. It's just the fact that, um, it wasn't the best time to, to seed some of these, and so yields decreased. This is another busy chart, which I'll try to explain, but it, it does show some interesting data. Um, again, uh, the growing degree days is on this axis, which from the previous slide, we know that the more growing degree days there were after seeding, the, the higher the yields. This equates to high yield areas on this part of the graph and lower yielding areas on this part of the graph equate with uh, lower amount of growing degree days. On this axis for just simply the seeding dates. So you can see as the earlier August dates um, yielded higher, or the August seeding dates yielded higher. And uh, as you moved later and later into the fall, um, the yield did drop off, but very curious, you're still receiving, you know, up to about October, the end of the first week of October, you're still getting about 70% of your yield potential. So again, not a catastrophic impact on, on yield for, uh, for uh, the later seeding dates. If you put this into a chart form, you'll see that seeding in that last week of August is the the best management practice that you can get to maximize your yields. And um, once you get into the later dates in, in May, you start dropping off, not catastrophically, but if you're trying to manage, you know, to, to uh, hit the higher yield for your crop, you should be trying to uh, seed, you know, um, from August 15th to about September the 15th in Manitoba. Uh, thank you, Ann Kirk, for this slide, which, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, our paradigm is, is uh, spring seeded crops. And so this basically outlines uh, something that um, most agronomists understand is that, you know, earlier seeding spring wheat provides higher yields. And so what we're looking at is, is relative yield on this axis here, increasing yields up to this point. And then down on the bottom are seeding dates. Um, this is the first week of May, the second week of May, first week of June, et cetera. And so this is the yield um, curve basically that you see for spring wheat. And, and we know that if you seed early in May, the chances are you're gonna yield better than if you seed in early June. And so what we wanted to do is, how does that compare to seeding winter wheat? And, and again, here for winter wheat was, you know, if you seeded that, that August 24th period, that's when you maximized your yield, similar to seeding the first week of May. 80% <clears throat> yield potential for winter wheat falls right around September 25th, which is between the third and fourth week of May for spring wheat crops, which means, you know, we, 
as agronomists, I don't think we'd hesitate to tell a producer if he asked us, you know what, um, it's getting later into May, should I seed my spring wheat? Uh, we would definitely encourage them to, to do that. And yet um, the, the similar practice for winter wheat would be seeding September 25th. So that would be a, a little bit of a paradigm shift for us to equate the two with the same advice. And similarly, you know, in, in those years where we're very wet in Manitoba, it's not rare for producers to be seeding into the first week of June. And um, for winter wheat, that's like seeding the first week of October. And that is something that is very hard for us to um, personally to promote. It just seems like uh, you're taking a big risk there. But um, generally, that's the same risk as a producer would be taking if they seeded the first week of June. Here's some uh, slides I took from the plots at Melita. And uh, just to show you what this actually looks like. So here's the seeding date of winter wheat here. Uh, I'm targeting that September 1st date. Of course, you're not always gonna be able to hit that date perfectly, but it, it compares that seeding date to the, uh, a month later, September 29th. And if you look at the, the, the plots here, you know, again, there, there's winter wheat growing here. It's fairly uniform. It's just not as vigorous as the others. Um, earlier seeded date. So it's going to come through the winter, it's going to grow, it's going to produce a crop. It's, it's likely not going to yield quite as much as the more vigorous crop that was seeded a little earlier. So one of the agronomic implications, I say that if I see a crop like this, I'm working with a producer, I know it's going to be less competitive in the spring. So I really encourage them to apply their fertility early as they can in the spring. As soon as they can get on that field, this, uh, you know, when that crop is greening up, get some fertility out there, get it some nutrition so it can start growing vigorously and compete. Here's a, another picture of, of the same seeding dates a little bit later in the year. This is uh, mid-June. And, and you can see that um, the early seeded crop is already headed out. Um, the later seeded crop is still looks like it's in around flag leaf stage. And the implication for that is again, you're gonna get a crop off of this, but you're gonna probably push that flowering into the um, fusarium window. So be, be quite aware as agronomists what those conditions are in the area. And that um, winter wheat generally misses that fusarium window, but this is more likely to, to hit into it. So um, you know, pay attention to the conditions and see if you might have to protect that crop. In Saskatchewan, yeah, you know, we're looking at a, a much bigger province agriculturally, uh, the, you know, more diverse soil zones in that province. And so to explain the research results there, Yvonne looked at two um, quadratic equations to explain that. And, and the one here is, is what happens when you have a, above average precipitation. And it's a similar yield, yield curve as Manitoba that, were, that shows when you have good precipitation and good heat, you know, uh, early planting does seem to pay off. Um, and um, the late planting is, is a, penalized a little bit. However, when you look at the same sites and you see uh, a normal or below normal precipitation, the, the curve changes quite a bit. And I think this is because, you know, if, if it's dry heading into the fall, um, you can seed early, but that doesn't mean the crop is going to emerge um, right away. It's going it, to, it's waiting for precipitation. So it could be, there could be a lot of heat available, but if there's no precipitation, you're going to, you're going to see that crop just sitting there until it gets precipitation. So seeding early under those conditions doesn't provide the same benefits. And this is shown in our chart here of above normal precipitation for these Saskatchewan sites and below normal. And you can see quite clearly that when you have good uh, rainfall, um, moisture, um, that seeding early does provide a benefit. But again, if, if, if the soil's dry and, and you're, you don't have much precip, then you know, seeding later is, is not a bad thing to do and the, the, because it's um, gonna emerge at the same time as the early seeded crop that was weighted for precipitation. As far as seed treatment results, um, you can see these charts, uh, grain yield on this side, seeding date on this side. Um, the solid line is the seed treatment versus uh, untreated seed. And so there is a, 
a benefit almost at every single seeding date to using a seed treatment. However, the, the biggest difference is occurs later in the year. And that makes sense. It's what I've seen is that when you're seeding later, you're starting to um, having a less um, vigorous crop. And so anything you can do to provide a little bit of a boost to that crop is a good thing. So using a seed treatment on these later seeded dates seem to provide the most benefit. And that reflects um, directly in plant counts. So if, uh, uh, if you're using a seed treatment here, uh, the solid line again, um, we did seem to see higher plant counts at every, every date, may not be um, significantly higher at every location, but um, again, it, it made the biggest difference using a seed treatment on those later seeded dates. And so um, here's a picture of what that looks like. I saw that consistently in, in studies that we did at the diversification centers here in Manitoba. And you can see the untreated um, plot on the left compared to the treated one on the right. And this is a picture taken in the fall, but if you took it in the spring, you'd see the same thing. It carries through to the spring. It, it just seems to provide that little bit extra uh, boost to the plant count, a little bit more uniform crop. And it, that tends to translate to better yields, um, but mostly, uh, if you're seeding later. And here, here's some of the data from that trial I just showed you that, you know, at, at Hamiota, uh, using Raxel, you, you, you had less winter kill on those sites. So that, may, that equated to higher plant counts in the spring on the uh, treated side. So in summary to Yvonne's um, study, you know, basically the late planting of winter wheat is possible and doesn't lead to catastrophic, catastrophic events. It just means that you're compromising your yield potential a little bit. <clears throat> you know, factors other than yield are important too. We found out of several sites in Manitoba, for instance, that um, fall precipitation had a lot more to do with how the plant yielded than seeding date. So, you know, in the areas around Winnipeg, environment had a, a bigger role to play than the actual data seeding. And finally, uh, many site years did not see a, a big response to seed treatment, but um, you know, th that those October, November seeding dates, those later dates did have uh, a benefit. Uh, Yvonne wants to thank uh, the Winter Sales Canada, Alberta, Ducks Unlimited, and AgriFood Canada for funding for this. Really quickly, I wanna wrap up with some of our own research we've been doing in Manitoba on fertility to try to push the yield ceiling. And here's the results of some of the other uh, earlier studies I took at these sites. And it, it, what it, we were trying to do is, is show conventionally um, fer, fertile uh, fertility practices for winter wheat, which were you know around that 100 pounds of N and 30 pounds of FOSS in the fall and trying to bump the N up to higher levels and see how yields reacted and we thought the um, nitrogen was the big key to unlocking the, the higher bushel um, per acre yields that you wanted to, but we didn't always see that. The curve was a little flatter than we wanted to see in most years and most sites. And so we, we took a step back and thought maybe we had to take more of a balanced fertility approach. And so uh, in the last year or two, we've been doing that. Here's some pictures of the trials using the balanced fertility which compares you know, the conventional practice versus adding a little um, potassium, which is what we found um, seemed to be lacking in availability. And, and you can see that um, this was pretty consistent all the way through the, the conventional practice. You, you did seem to see uh, a little bit more daylight through the rows, more competitive all through the season, season for the balanced fertility. And, and that again was, um, we saw that in the spring also, just a more competitive crop with a balanced versus the um, uh, conventional practice. And in tw 2019, we also did these um, practices on farmer demos on, on, at the field scale. And we found that our demos averaged 80 bushel an acre, whereas the provincial average that year was only 58. So there's something to be said for this balanced fertility. Um, I think part of it was the fact that 
you know, we, we see more green all through the year and extending into the fall. And here's some green on the flag leaves on the balanced side versus the conventional side had already died off. And I think that's at least partially due to the fact that, you know, here's a chart from KWS that shows how much of the yield potential comes from the leaves for flag leaf in particular for wheat. It's quite a bit, 57% of the filling comes from your, your flag leaf. So um, keeping that green and functional is, is very important for yield. And here's some of the early results we received at these dates. Um, we, we looked at three different varieties and compared to conventional, which is 30 pounds of P at seeding and 100 pounds of N in the spring versus what we call balanced, which was based on a Western egg recommendation. And uh, they have their own so proprietary um, technology that they use to test soils. We've been getting some really good results with them on our demos for the last couple of years. Producers are happy with the results. And here, where they saw that adding a little K in the fall, plus half of our N, we really push um, putting some of your nitrogen down, at least in the fall. And the results uh, speak for themselves where we're seeing quite a bit of a yield boost in all, every variety um, using these um, balanced fertility approach. So basically, um, if you want to press through that uh, yield ceiling, you really have to uh, focus on balanced fertility and, and trying to get into that uh, earlier seeding window. So with that, I'll say thank you and uh, take any questions. Great, so thanks for the presentation, Ken. There are a few questions here for you. Uh, so the first question is, uh, being that canola, which um, typically precedes winter wheat, is very hard on mycorrhiza, have you done trials of adding mycorrhiza uh, versus a seed treatment? Well, that's a good question. I have not even thought about using that, so um, we'll have to look into that a little bit. Uh, and I have another question here. Uh, on the balanced fertility treatments, what nutrient do you attribute the response to, or do you think it was a combination? And then also, what rate of nitrogen and phosphorus did you use? Yeah, I, th I think there was a combination of factors that went into that. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we, I originally thought that you know pushing nitrogen was the, was the yield. Um, things that nitrogen was what was limiting yield initially, but we pushed that up to really high levels, and we didn't see a, a tremendous response in most years. So. I think um, when we started using more of a balanced approach, we would use less nitrogen and a little bit more phosphorus and potassium too. Um, a lot of our soils show that we have a lot of available, a lot of potassium here, but um, it may not be available. And Western Ag has a, um, their own technology for measuring that. So they've been very good partners on this. So uh, what we were targeting, um, the producer practice was basically using 30 pounds of P and 100 pounds of N first thing in the spring. And ours bumped the nitrogen a little bit and uh, potassium a little bit. Well, no, the phosphate a little bit and added a little potassium. And it, it just varied based on the sites, how much it did increase um, based on what was available. Thank you. Uh, so, Ken, during uh, part of the presentation, there was a graph that you were showing uh, from Yvonne Lally's research. I don't know if you have it available to pull up and just show everyone because it was tough to see, but I think it's a really interesting graph and um, does a really good job of summarizing her research looking at, um, you know, the seeding date, the plant stand and the, and the yields. Okay. If you have the, we have a few minutes, so if you have the time to pull it up on your screen and share it, sure. that would be great. Um, Okay. Is this the one you're, can you see my screen? Um, I think that just one before that. Oh, yeah, maybe it was, I, I thought like the two um, results for the seeding date, if you could maybe share those and um, just describe them again for everyone. Cause I think they're, um, yeah, yeah, just really interesting results. So this this chart here. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right. So basically, she wanted to determine um, using a quadratic equation some kind of relationship between um, yield and 
seeding date. And so along this axis here, and I'm sorry, it was a little blurry at the start, obviously, but here's, here's your increasing yield on this side. And here's along the ba base is your growing degree days. And so what she found was the sweet spot was right at 660 growing degree days, which was your ideal planting dates. Um, so that equated to about August 15th to September 1st was your ideal um, seeding date. And um, uh, the earlier, earliest seeding dates, the August 15th, sorry, this is about your September 1st. This is about your earliest dates, about August 15th for over here. So obviously if you're seeding earlier in August, you're gonna get more growing degree days and this is seeding later, so you're going to get less seed growing degree days. So that's why late planting is on this side, which is a little bit counterintuitive. But um, yeah, your best seeding um, dates are uh, right there around um, last week of August. Um, Mid-August, early planting is a little bit of a yield potential um, decrease. And we know that from some of Fowler's earlier research. And then uh, there were some um, penalties as you moved later into October and November. I would like to say, you know, that I have worked with producers and we've uh, targeted um, dormant seeding on purpose just to, um, because uh, growing winter wheat does fr um, free up your workload a little bit. And they had so many acres, they wanted to get some in the ground the year before. So um, they dormant seeded it and it uh, came up next spring. It always seems to vernalize. I've seen that happen again and again and again. It always seems to vernalize and create a crop. And their yield that year on that field was better than their spring wheat. And about halfway between their spring wheat and their, their winter wheat that they had seeded in September 15th. So um, yeah, dormant seeding is interesting. Uh, just generally leads to a little bit later harvested crop. Is that what you wanted to hear, Anne? Is there anything else? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. And I have a couple other questions here. Uh, the first one is, um, I, I believe this is, I'm not sure which, uh, which study it's referring to, but maybe you could answer for your fertility study. If the high yield equaled, if the high yielded treatments equaled the often return on investment. Yeah. We should have uh, we should have included an economic component to to these studies, um, so I'd be guessing at that. All I can tell you is our producers that were part of the um, field scale studies were pretty happy to to get about 80, 80 to eighty five bushels an acre on their on their crop, and uh, we also seem to have a opportunity with um, one of the Parish and Heimbecker seems to have a program for a winter wheat, a winter wheat contract where these, they seem to be able to um, get about $7 a bushel contract for winter wheat. They seem to be pretty easy to work with. So uh, that's uh, something else that they've locked in there. So when, when you're growing, um, you know, these are average years. These weren't great years for winter wheat the last two years. So they were getting about 80 bushels an acre and selling it for about $7 a Bushel, they were pretty happy with their returns. But yeah, we should have probably examine the economics behind it a little bit better. Thank you. And I think we have time for one last question here. Um, also about the fertility study. And it's, do you think the yields would have been more similar to the balanced treatments if the nitrogen was split fall and spring on the other sites? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's something that we should explore a little bit more because I've been pushing for years for producers to get some nitrogen down in the fall. And um, we were pushing, you know, applying years ago, we were pushing uh, them applying their nitrogen first thing in the spring, um, because that's really important for yield. You see a big yield difference uh, between getting your uh, nitrogen on as soon as the crop greens up um, to between that and when it starts tillering, you can see a 20% yield decrease if, if you wait. So I've been pushing that for a long, long time um, to get it on in the fall because, you know, it's nice to say to get it on early in the spring, but um, reality is in Manitoba, especially, it's either too wet to get it on early in the spring or if it's dry, it doesn't matter if you get it on early, it's still not available to the plant as it grows. So 
yeah, we're seeing a, a lot of uh, producers starting to put it on in the fall, and there's definitely a benefit um, for doing that. So we should probably reevaluate this study and maybe look at a few different, isolate a few different factors to see how much each of them contributes to the change in yield. Great, thank you. Thanks for the great presentation and um, the answers.